Joining us now from the Ingle Media Empire, and he, he looks gorgeous with that smile, missing a tooth. Other than that, how was your summer, Kevin Woodley of NHL.com? It was good, minus the uh, the pulling of the tooth, which is never an easy process when it's been in your mouth as as long as mine had been. As I as I approach fifty, let's just say that it was pretty close to a minute for every year I've been on this earth that they had to work on pulling this bloody thing. But it's uh, it's a cautionary tale for goalies. Every time you get hit in the mask and it feels like it got punched in the mouth, and you think no big deal, well, eventually it becomes a big deal. The root dies, and you end up looking like me and. Yeah, not not fun. Believe it or not, the worst part is I actually had to pay to look like this, and a fair amount. So uh, yeah, it's, other than that, great summer. But the the my kids uh, keep asking me if I have a, a problem that, that that we don't know about. But uh, it's just it's just hockey. You are straight out of central central casting right now. Like honestly, you look like you're uh, going into slap shot. Shorzy, I, I saw Shorzy once, and I had to, I had to go this way. Anyways, we hope you have a good insurance plan. And speaking of insurance plans. Spencer Martin, they're expecting a lot from him there, backup goaltender for the Vancouver Canuck. Let's ask the Bodog poll question. We're talking about it yesterday when Thatcher gave that terrific answer about workload where he said, look, it's not up to me, but, you know, sometimes whatever you plan out at this time of year is not the way the season plays out, that it has its its own rhythm. Over under 57 starts for Demko. Kev, where are you going? Oh, it's funny. Uh I think Jim Rutherford might answer under on this, if, just based on one conversation I had with him for a piece at NHL.com and, and what he said after the season. Uh, I think Thatcher Demko is going to tell you over, and my hunch would be over as well. And I think I don't think that needs to be a bad thing uh, because as much as you know, clearly it was a little too much, you know, based on the injury late in the season uh, for Thatcher Demko. Uh, I, I think that we went into last year knowing. And I said it in the preseason. It wasn't just about the Canucks. It was all around the league. I know we didn't, it didn't, didn't end up becoming an Olympic break. But the schedule after what was supposed to be the Olympic break was frankly absurd. And you needed two goalies to get through that stretch. And, you know, the combination of their situation, as you mentioned, and Yaroslav Halak going through his, his little dip during that period and then not getting through a couple of starts, which, which exacerbated it and can't happen again this year. Like, that just all piled up for the Canucks in a, in a unique season in terms of scheduling. So I think, I think over 57 and, and in the range of 60 is probably more likely and maybe not as problematic as a lot of people might assume, given that, what, three goalies... Topped the league last year. Connor Hellebuck didn't have a great season. UC Saros and Thatcher Demko. There's your one, two, three in terms of games played. Two of the three didn't make it to the end of the year. So I get the concern. I think it's a little muted this season because of the nature of the schedule. We don't know what COVID's going to look like this year at all. But, I mean, just using what we have as empirical evidence, how deep are we going to go on the Canucks school tenny depth chart, do you think? Is it safe to say that Colin Delia and, and even Arthur Silovs get – a game or two at some point this season? I would have said for sure if we were using the same testing rules that, that we did last year. What, 119 goalies, a lot of teams going like five and six deep. Um, I just think that a lot of that was probably related to, you know, guys missing time. Even the Canucks, right? Like, it was Halak and, and Demko at the same time, one after another, and that gave Spencer Martin his opportunity. So um, without those same type of testing rules and the likelihood of guys sort of being forced to sit on the sidelines because of COVID... You're probably looking at a normal year where we see up to 100 goalies play in the NHL, not like 119 like we did last year. You might, you know, some teams will get away with two. Most teams will go three and some will need four, maybe even five. Where the Canucks sort of figure in that measurement probably depends largely on the health of Demko. Because if you lose him, then you're probably not in an every night situation for Spencer Martin. You know, I mean, as as incredible as he was last year, expecting a 950 this year is not realistic. And you're probably looking at having to play both. And, you know, then you get into a situation where you're asking more of both and who knows what happens. You could end up with a fourth guy. So I don't know that it's likely you get to four because you have stability. Well, you have experience at three. Like you, you think you could go to Dealey and, and get some games out of him. The other thing about Colin is, I expect him to be somewhat like Spencer Martin last year. Like he's come in here, he's he knew what he was coming into. He told me that he watched Spencer play last year in the American League and like I sort of eyebrows raised like, "Hey, that's not the same goalie I used to watch. Like something's going on here." Um and so, 
you know, he's bought into the same types of changes. There may be some growing pains early like there was for Spencer, but they see a skill set that they believe can translate into being more under their system than he perhaps was playing um, the way he has throughout his career to this point. Do you buy that? Do you, do you like what you've seen from him, what you know of him? Yeah, no, I mean, he's got a, just an absolute ton of horsepower. Like, he is so powerful. And what he used to do is sort of lock in his inside edges and try and be patient and, they, and then make one big push. Um, sort of keeping that horsepower in reserve, playing a little more narrow, a little more upright. A lot of the smaller shuffles you see uh, from the Canucks goalies. And I should point out, like, around the league, you're seeing guys make similar type of adaptations in their stance uh, their sort of multi-stance systems and the structure with which they play, narrowing their stance, tolling up a little more sort of uh, shuffle work rather than big T pushes and those big sort of loaded up slides like we used to see at Adelia, and they're having success. Like as much as we focus on Spencer Martin making those changes, I look at a guy like Charlie Lindgren who got five games in the NHL after, you know, not, didn't even get into the lineup for the Canadians the year before, goes to St. Louis, makes similar changes, Posts a 950 something in five games with the Blues, and now he's the backup in Washington. So, uh, knowing the skill set that Colin has, and knowing that they picked him because of that, and then hearing him talk about how he's embraced it, does make me believe that you know we'll sort of see a similar trajectory. Does it get as high as what Spencer Martin achieved last year? I can't tell you that, but at the very least, you know you have a willing student buying into changes that have made other goalies with similar sort of skill profiles have success or led them to success. Now, when the decision was made that he, Martin was going to be the backup goaltender and he was terrific in those three games and, you know, that gave them some evidence. Let's face it, some of this was a salary cap decision. They didn't have a lot of money for the backup goaltender. They knew he would come cheap. But remember, G.T. Miller wasn't locked up then. There was a sense that, you know, maybe the Canucks would put their best foot forward this year but really try and get their cap in order and target a future year in terms of optimal competitiveness, or at least um, what they thought would be the contending years. So much has changed here now. Now they've re-signed Miller. They've added other forwards. They've added to their cap commitments going forward, uh, let alone getting rid of some. As j always says, that backup goaltender is going to have to win you 10, 12, maybe 15 games. Do you think Spencer Martin at all have that in them? Yeah, I mean, I do. A lot of this is going to depend on what happens in front of them, right? Like, this, that's a conversation we've had for years. I mean, when I, I looked it up the other day because somehow I got tagged in a conversation online uh, on social media about Demko being an average goalie and the Canucks being a good defensive team. And, you know, after I pulled my eyeballs back into my head, I looked it up and, and it was like they're 27th in clear sight analytics and in, in expected goals against across the board. I don't think their PK was the underlying numbers were necessarily as bad as the results, especially early, but they're just, they haven't been a great defensive team. And so a little more structure, a little more for goalies. We don't think of it as structure. We think of it as predictability. Like even if we're going to give up chances, knowing where they're more likely to come from, knowing what chances we're willing to concede and what I can trust the guys in front of me to take away a little more sort of uh, predictability in that regard will help Spencer Martin. Is there a risk because of how few games he's played and how long it's been since he's been in the NHL? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but look at how it's gone spending big money on veterans the last couple of years. And again, I, I should add that Yaroslav Halak's adjusted numbers were actually pretty good last season, even with that little three-game dip after he had requested a trade and thought he would have been moved and then sort of played through it and maybe wasn't as into it as he should have been. Um, even with that, his adjusted numbers you know, flush out in like the top 15 save percentage-wise. So they actually got decent performances out of him. Again, that points to the environment. Listen, um, can I say for sure that Spencer Martin can pick up where he left off? No. Do I expect a 950 save percentage out of him? I think that would be absurd, frankly, especially over a larger sample size. Teams are going to get a pre-scout. They're going to build a book. Um, But do I have a belief that the changes he made are sticky? That he'll be able, the simplifications in his game will continue to translate as an NHL goaltender, when I look at, you know, again, third round pick took him a while to sort of get these voices that fit what he wanted to hear that sort of made a difference in his game. Yeah, I, I do. Like, I, I do think, and, and part of that is, and, and listen, we all know I'm biased here because I he's the guy that got me into goaltending way back in his first stint with the Cucks in 2004. Part of that is a belief in the way Ian Clark teaches, and part of that is a belief in the high standards that he demands. Like, 
I don't know many goalie coaches push their goalies as hard as Ian Clark does. And there are some guys that get rubbed the wrong way by it. But I know all three guys they have here, and I guess beyond that with Silovs and even Mikey, um, are on board with it and, and eager to sort of be pushed in that direction. And so that lends to my belief that Spencer Martin can serve as a good NHL backup. And again, we tend to fall in love with names, right? Like they're, they're still paying for two of them. Right. And, and neither guy sort of delivered what was expected. Well, well let's talk more about the environment because you mentioned it. Uh, the forwards are going to try to be more conscientious. JT Miller has said that, you know, he wants to see the 200 foot the defensive part of his game improve. But what about the defensemen that are in front as well? That's the same group for the most part, um, save maybe Jack Rathbone being tasked with a little bit more duty. What do you think the chances are that the defensemen make life a little bit better or that the team makes life a little bit better for the goaltenders? I, I think we have a tendency to associate good defense with good defensemen. And I'll give you exhibit A. Like, I think the Vegas Golden Knights have good defensemen, right? Like, I think we can agree on that. Like, when you look at the, especially the top end of that, they don't have good def- They haven't played good defense or they didn't under Pete DeBoer. And I don't just mean last year when they were, you know, riddled with injuries throughout the lineup. The year before, like, they leaned as heavily on Marc-Andre Fleury and Robin Lehner as any team leaned on goaltending. Low expected save percentages, a lot of high danger chances. So just having good defensemen does not automatically mean you play good defense. And so it is encouraging to hear, you know, a guy in the leadership group like JT Miller, who frankly hasn't been a great defensive player throughout his career, is transitioning to center from playing the wing, to hear him talk about how how sort of aware he is of that and how conscientious he intends to be about improving it. Because it's your leadership that sets that example and others are willing to follow. So if your top players are cheating towards offense, if they're not taking care of the details and the work rate required to be good defensively, then that bleeds throughout the lineup, frankly. It goes to everything, and this is one of the little nits I pick. Like, watch the line changes. Like, who's, who's late getting off the hang of minus on somebody else? Is that your, is that your top center, or is he busting to get back and, and, and be, you know, provide that back pressure off the rush or get a quick change? Like, those are the types of habits that seem like tiny little details, but make a difference when you're trying to be better as a team defensively. You're right. There are questions about the back end, Blake. Um, I think that it requires a five-man effort to be better than the sum of those parts. And at the very least, talk is cheap, but we're hearing the right messaging about that. I don't know that we've even heard that, frankly, for the past number of years. Another thing I'll add, I mean, they were eighth in goals against last year. That's with the penalty kill ranked 30th in the NHL. Crazy now. Think. It clicked at 80% after Bruce Boudreaux got here, but it was down in the low 60s, historically low before that. We think Mikheyev and the penalty kill are going to be better off the hop of the season here. It'll be interesting to see where this defensive group goes, and whether or not it gets all the help. Uh, it, it, it gives the goaltenders all the help it can get. And then Archer Silovs, he seems to have ascended here, jumped Mikey DiPietro on the depth chart, I'd like to know what you're hearing about Arthur Archer Silovs, his Penticton tournament, his summer, and, and what it was that brought Sil- Silovs a little more forward here. Heard good things about his first start, Matt, um, but don't love, don't like blowing smoke. Won't won't BS you. I didn't watch a lot, right? So talked to a couple of people about that first start, but I didn't get it. I didn't go to Penticton, and I wasn't glued to YouTube to watch those games. With all apologies to the teams involved. Um, listen, his. Uh, there are people in the organization and the goalie department that have been big on Silov since he was drafted. Ian Clark obviously being one of them, like he thinks there's a player there. Uh, and there were times when there were other people in the organization that I don't think saw it, saw it the same way and, and weren't seeing what he was seeing. But in the past year, I think he's been proven right a little bit. Um, the performance at the World Championships, uh, and it wasn't Minnows they were playing. Uh, he, you know, he had some really nice outings there for Latvia. I think he finished with like a 9.52. Um, Arter's is incredibly fast. Uh, over at inglemag.com, we do a lot of pro drills where we have uh, drills of NHL and American Hockey League goalies and the goalie coach sort of running them through the drills. And then we do a Zoom session with the goalie coach and they walk us through the keys and the tips and sort of t- to try and provide a learning tool for young kids or young goalie coaches that want to see how these guys work. And the one thing about our tours that always jumped out, like the speed, the pace, it's Demco-esque. 
but almost too quick at times. He gets a little overactive, and so they almost need him to slow down. He's so damn quick. Um, he wants to go into save mode all the time, and so there's a learning curve that's going to come with playing games in terms of that process. Last year won great for him in terms of not playing games. Took him a while to get him that spot in the ECHL. I'm curious to see which way it goes this year. I think they have one spot in the coast, Kalamazoo, if I'm not mistaken, where they can send a guy and, and sort of be assured of him getting a decent play in terms of games. Whether that's Arturs or that's Mikey, I can't say. Um, you know, I think there are people here that, that think Arturs has passed him on the depth chart. I'm not sure it's everybody. We'll have to sort of see how they go early. Because like I said, Delia might take some adjustments. Don't forget, Spencer Martin never played for a month, first month of last season. It was all about making these changes to his games. I think I don't think deals will take that long to, to sort of make these changes in eight because he came in a month early and started working on them. Um, but, you know, there might be an opportunity there early for Mikey to, to, to reestablish himself as one of their key guys in the American Hockey League. And then Arturs, because of his age... You know, just getting him a spot to play games is important. And if that has to be elsewhere, then it has to be elsewhere. It's become a problem the last couple of years for this organization is having spots for their goalies to play. But it's in some ways a good problem to have. It's better than not having goalies that can play at any spot. Lastly, Di Pietro, Mikey Di Pietro, with or him? Well, what's going on? What's the latest that you hear? He asked for a trade. Yeah, is he going to be in can? Is he going to stick around this year with the Canucks? What's up? No, you know, like. I know there are people that still believe in Michael DPS. Like, I'm one of them. So, um, but I remember having these conversations with Curtis Sanford. I know he's not with the organization anymore, uh, moving on to Toronto, but like, he still believed in Michael DiPietro. Last year wasn't a great year. I think there's some belief in the organization that, you know, maybe uh, he was still focusing a little too much on how he got screwed the year before. And there's no other way to put it, right? Like, that was, we called that one from the beginning. Um, the refusal to go and spend on a taxi squad veteran cost him a year of development. And so maybe focusing a little too much on that as opposed to just moving forward. Uh, golf and goaltending, it's the same thing, right? You have to have a next shot mentality. If you're thinking about the last year, or you're thinking about you know what the final score is or how many, sh- like you're done. You have to be in the moment. And maybe that was an issue, it sounds like, for Michael DiPietro. Talked with him when they when he when he showed up at uh, at eight ranks a little bit. Just had a little back and forth on the phone, and it sounds like he's really changed his mindset coming into the season. Sort of refocused himself, recognizes the need to sort of just get back into the moment and get back to being Mikey DiPietro and having fun. I believe in the skill set. I believe in the talent. Um, I believe it's good enough to overcome the size, and so it's just a matter of whether that opportunity will come here or somewhere else. I don't think Matt that they're going to trade him at this point. Uh, there were, I believe there were opportunities to move him in the summer, but you know, you're not just going to give him away, not as we started off the hop in a league where some teams ended up running five deep last year, because you're not going to give him away for a guy you don't think can play when you still think he might be able to, or you know he can play in the American League, and you think he might be able to play in the NHL. You're not just going to give that away for something you're pretty confident can't, and that was kind of the types of trades they were presented with. I was thinking you're going to say lidocaine, a lidocaine shot in order to get a new tooth put in. As you sit here smiling and ask Kev, I think the next shot you should take should be at Northlands on the golf course with Blake and I, all right? No more of these shots to the face in goal. You're pushing 50. Too old for that. I'm The, the next shot is going to be from an x-ray machine to see how well the oh. bone is growing back in because I am desperately, and I mean I want to know desperately where they take it out trying, I'm trying to wait this out a little bit so that I don't need a bone graft before they put the implant in, because I've, I've heard they take it out of the, I've heard it's miserable, and I'm trying to avoid that stuff. 